And we are live. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mr. Chuck Dixon. This hey, is so doing? surreal for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I'm really thank you for accepting my, my invitation. And I'm wearing my Frankcastle t shirt. Yeah, you. Um, no, I really thank you for accepting my invitation, and I I would like to start. Uh, well, I don't know if I should do it myself, but sometimes I ask to my guests to if they can introduce themselves to to the audience because my my audience is really broad. There's a fan okay. of electronic music, fan of politics, fan of comics. Uh, so it will be nice to, you know, I'd like to yeah. know you. Okay, well, uh, I'm Chuck Dixon. Uh, I'm a comic book writer. I've been a comic book writer professionally for about 35 years. I had long runs on uh, Batman. I'm probably most famous for co-creating uh, the Batman vill villain Bane. And uh, I've written Punisher, Conan the Barbarian, SpongeBob SquarePants. Green Arrow, uh, you know, uh, Robin, Catwoman, just uh, I've, I've written well over 40,000 pages of comics. Birds of, Birds of Prey? You say that? Birds of Prey, Birds of Prey as well. Uh, yeah, I've worked on a, a lot of books and, and I've worked for almost every single major comic book publisher. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And I would like to start asking you how you start on this is like like crazy uh, i but well, i don't know H how you start what what do you what you were thinking <laughs> when you say i want to write comic books well I, I fell in love with comics when i was a kid uh and i just it was my favorite medium uh more so than music television or movies i loved comic books and uh, i pretty much didn't even really it wasn't really even a decision it was just I was just drawn to them and I just wanted to work in them in, in whatever capacity. And uh, I wasn't a very good artist, so I turned to the writing end and mm -hmm. I just kept trying to get in. And, and, and But you tried to draw a little? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, there's, actually a, there's actually a comic that I drew uh, in the 80s for Eclipse. I drew one issue of a comic called Radio Boy. It was a satire on uh, Japanese manga. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, I think I saw that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, but I'm I'm not I'm I'm not that good an artist. I didn't go to art school. I wasn't disciplined mm -hmm. or trained enough. So uh, I turned to the writing end, and um, you know, once I got in, I got in rather late in life. You know, I didn't become a full time comic book writer until I was 32, and uh, but I'm glad for that because I had a lot of life experience to bring to bring to the work, and. Um, you know, that's it. It was a lot of it was just persistence. Mm. And there was a character that you were a fan from the beginning. Oh, I, well, I I like Batman. Uh, I was a big fan of Tarzan, uh, and uh, when Spider Man came along, I became mm. devoted to devoted to Steve Ditko's uh, Spider Man comics. Yeah, because I think Spider Man changed everything. I think. Yeah, it, it really did. It really did. I was I was there for the beginnings. I was a kid for the beginnings of the Marvel Age of Comics, and it was it was pretty cool. Yeah. So that that for me is the 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 more important about the beginnings because yeah. now the the comic book industry is not what was in the beginnings. I I grew up also being a comic book fan and. I, I would like to share if you can share all those, all the kind of memories when you start to write for comics. What what was your first uh, comic that you? Um, well, I mean, pretty much, you know, with the mainstream comics, pretty much simultaneously, I got a break at Eclipse Comics to write a comic called Airboy, and almost at the same time. Uh, I started working at Marvel for Larry Hama on uh, Savage Sword of Conan, uh, doing backup stories. <clears throat> and um, eventually Larry let me do the lead feature on Conan, which let me go full time. 
you know, I quit my regular job and just mm. became a comic book writer because I had guaranteed 50 pages a month of, of Conan. But how you start, you, you, you kind of have to send your, I don't know, your, your ideas to Marvel, to DC, to Eclipse, or? Well, well, I, you, yeah, I, I used to go to conventions and try to meet every creator and editor I could and just sort of okay. build a What we, we call now networking. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And try to build a rapport, get them to remember me. I never pitched anything at cons, but I would, you know, use that invitation at the convention to uh, get an interview. And then I would, you know, go up to Marvel or DC and, and show them what I had. And, um, you know, but the thing is, I mean, Larry Hama hired me. He had no idea who I was. I, I called him on the phone and, and talked to him. And he, and he said, well, send me some ideas. And then he... he You know, he bought a bunch of them. So that's how that started. I mean, he didn't know me. I'd never met him before. That's so, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It just takes that one break. And, it, and then once I was in and I proved my reliability. And, mm. you know, that, But then I at that time, the, the comic book, uh, I don't know, business was really close. Like it was hard to, to get well, in. It, it wasn't. In the 70s, it was hard. I, I would go up to D.C., And they would have all of us in one room to tell us you're not going to get any work here. <laughs> you couldn't get a one-on-one -on -one interview. It was it was like five guys in a conference room, and they would have a assistant editor say, "There's no work," you know. But then in the <laughs> 80s, in the 80s, it, it began to explode with the you know because the comic shops were open and there was more mm. uh, more publishers, more stuff being put out. So if you had any kind of talent, you know, you could get a job in comics. You just had to be persistent. So, so the doors kind of opened in the '80s to a whole new bunch of creators. Mm. And you, what was your dream when you were starting? Like working, like writing for Batman or writing I, for Spider-Man? Or I, I just loved the medium. I, you know, I love the characters, but I just loved the medium. I wanted to work in any kind of comics I could work mm. in. It didn't matter what it was to me. And when I got Batman, it was like, I can't believe this. I, I didn't even try to get Batman because mm. Batman is like the Mount Everest. It's, it's the most popular comic book character in the world. Mm. And I never thought I'd work on it. But Denny O'Neill reached out for me because he liked my work on Airboy. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't have a, a dream project or a dream character in mind. I just wanted to work in the medium, no matter what it was. Yeah. You know, Western, war comics, anything they had, I wanted to write. Yeah. No, I think that's important, especially for the young uh, generation, because I think they get frustrated really quickly. Yeah. Like my dream is to uh, draw or write for Spider-Man, and right. if they didn't do it, uh, they get frustrated, and then they say, no, I will not gonna do that. I I think uh, more in the old days we, we had the persistence, the yeah. the stamina to. Yeah, if, if you 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 work well, and you you keep uh, the perseverance. Uh, if you understand the language of comics, I mean, uh, because I love the media, you know, more than the characters. Even I never mm -hmm. became a specialist. I never worked in one or two genres. I could sure. basically write comics in any genre, and mm -hmm. I think that's been the secret of my longevity because. You know, uh, I don't care if it's The Simpsons or Conan. You know, mm. I, I know how to write comics. Yeah. No, I think that's important. And that can be translated to music. You know, yeah. if you get a stock in just one genre, it will, it's, it's really hard to, you know, um, get noticed. So you have to keep, keep doing what you do because you love it, you know. That, yeah, that for me is important. It's yeah, like they, they put the when they say find a job that you love and you were not going to work anymore. <laughs> I, I think it, your, your analogy to music is a good one because you have to have a grounding in all kinds of music, you know, yeah. even if it's outside your genre to, uh, to really excel. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Yeah. So your first break was with the Eclipse comic and then, Then right away was Batman? No, no. Um, I, I worked at 
I worked at Eclipse. I worked at Marvel. I worked at a bunch of other independent companies. Mm. And um, I guess it was, I was in the business about six or seven years before mm -hmm. um, Denny O'Neill called me up and said that he wanted me to, uh, he was looking for a writer for, for Robin. And Robin. He liked, he liked my Airboy work. He liked how I wrote mm. the character. Uh, so yeah, because I, I remember during that time they wanted to kind of switch the character of Robin, give it yeah. a little bit more, I don't know, dark or real. Well, they, they had Jason Todd as Robin for a while and the mm. readers hated him. Uh, so when they got rid of him, <laughs> they wanted to have a character as different from Jason Todd as possible. Mm. And when I met with Denny, he explained to me their problems with the Jason Todd character, why they thought readers didn't respond to him. And uh, basically, you know, my job was to try to help fix that. And for you, what was the problem? Um, he was, um, Jason Todd was kind of a, a, a rebellious character. He'd been a juvenile delinquent. Uh, he didn't. Uh, he didn't always listen to what Batman told him to do. He broke the rules, and, yeah. and for some reason, readers did not like a sidekick who didn't listen to the hero. They they didn't. Yeah. They, 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 because I don't think comic book fans, particularly American comic book fans, identified with that kind of character. So sure. so I worked on Tim Drake, and basically that was a character they could identify with. He was uh, a little bit more reluctant. Uh, he realized his shortcomings. He 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 had to work very hard to become Robin, you know, um, more so than Dick Grayson because Dick Grayson was a natural athlete. So I put all of this into Tim Drake that he was someone that the readers could relate to a little bit more. Mm. And when you when you write, you put kind of um, elements of your personality on it in certain characters. I I think I think. I think if I do, I do it unconsciously. Because uh, people always talk about what's the theme of your work. And I always say, well, the theme of my work, that's for the reader to decide. I don't think uh -huh. about the theme when I'm working. I'm just telling a story. So, yeah, sometimes unconsciously, I'll, you know, I, I probably insert myself or people I know. I certainly use voice patterns of people that I know. So, mm. But you never, I don't know read one of your work and say, well, holy shit, that's me. <laughs> no, not really. Not really. I mean, <laughs> separate myself from it. Um, I, and I'm kind of happy about that. I mean, I'm an invisible yeah. hand writer. I don't, yeah. I don't write so that people notice the writing. Mm. Right? And I don't write in a, in that kind of self-conscious way. Sure. Um, you know, wh wherever the stories come from, um, you know, in my brain, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's so much connected to my psyche because I'm able to write convincingly characters that I don't agree with at all. On, on sure. The, you know, For example? Um, well, like Batman's stand against guns. Um, I've written lots of passionate <laughs> speeches for Batman, how you know he doesn't like firearms and they're for cowards and all things. And I, these are opinions I don't hold myself. But I'm... I'm not there to put my words in Batman's mouth. I'm there to make Batman believable and then mm. bring his words to life. So um, Oliver Queen, Green Arrow was another character. I, I never agreed with anything Oliver Queen said, but but I had to put myself in his shoes, put myself sure. in his mouth. No, that's great. Yeah. But I think it's a great exercise. I, I think it could be very fun to be Batman or Green Arrow just for a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 pretty much. I'm I'm still all inspired by the fact that I got to write these characters. Hmm. I, I never wrote the words Batman and Robin without going. Wow, I'm writing Batman. <laughs> <and Robin." laughs> oh, that's amazing, and we we can see it when in in your podcast or even in your writing that you are a real true comic book fan is not like uh, you know like a regular job oh okay i will write this <laughs> yeah, yeah, i can't i mean whenever i'm offered a job i always say well let me think about it i never take a job right away because i want to think about it do i really want to write this and and what would i bring to it i mean i don't want to take a job 
where I'm not going to bring any level of enthusiasm to because the readers mm. will feel that. So yeah. I always work on things that, you know, because people always say, what, what job did you hate the most? I, I never had a job I hated the most because I wouldn't take that job. <laughs> That's cool. That's a good philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it leads to not having any work, but, you know, just find something else. <laughs> yeah, of course. And when, when you take your inspiration, like in the news or personal experience or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, a lot of times things happen in the news, and you just sort of file it away. Um, I read a lot of news about technology and science um, to try to stay ahead of the curve on all that stuff, and a lot of times that will spawn ideas, you know, new developments um, in science, new discoveries. Uh, I can always use that. Uh, <clears throat> there's a newspaper here. Well, it's, it's all over the world, the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal has a regular column about art theft. <laughs> you know, art theft. Yeah, really? about stolen paintings. Uh, and where, <laughs> you know, uh, and what's the status of this case? And I, I read them all the time because they're they're great grist for like crime stories. So oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And any I don't know you saw uh, like kind of the crime shows when they talk about uh, you know how the guy get away with murder or... well yeah I, I i read a lot of crime novels you know i watch you know i, I watch a lot of crime television shows and i, I watch a lot of crime television shows and, and movies from all around the world uh, you know uh just to get a different perspective and for the most part i like crime television shows from other countries better than the ones here so yeah there's yeah. no that so I bring here some some of your work because yeah. finally uh, this year I succeed to complete my collection of is is just the first uh, the first um, collection of the Punisher, you know, was before War Journal and War Sun, right? Was like in the well, in the nineties, and I remember this comic. This comic was great. That's my first Punisher story. <laughs> Because he was looking for a bad guy. And the, well, I will gonna spoil the comic, sorry. <laughs> But the, 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 the bad guy was a victim. So I found that uh, really um, clever and original. I, I'm sure maybe you don't remember the story, but I there was, I do remember the story. I, I always like to defy the reader's expectations. Yeah, I, I love that. I love when, like Night Shyamalan, when you're watching, <laughs> I don't know, you're watching uh, The the Village or Unbreakable, and right. at the end you are, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the most perfect ending to a story is one that makes you in that one second when you when when it's revealed that everything you knew about the movie was wrong and yeah. you carried your mind back over yeah. the movie as and you have to and you're putting it all together in your mind it, it creates this like brain freeze that's actually delightful it's this catharsis this emotional catharsis yeah that, no i i think that's, that's you know, movies like like empire strikes back when we find out darth is his father It makes you go back over two movies. <laughs> it's like, well, well, how's that possible? And, yeah. uh, you know, movies like Chinatown is another one. Uh, the Usual Suspects, movies that make you the remember usual the whole just movie amazing. in just a few seconds. Yeah. No, that I think is great. And it's really hard to do. Yes. Especially, yeah, especially during this day that, I don't know, I think people have more access to information so they can... It's hard to get sur surprised the, the audience, I think. Well, we're, we're exposed to so much story content now. I mean, we're constantly mm. being told stories all mm. day long. And, uh, you know, whether it's the news or something we're watching or reading or something we see on the Internet, we're constantly being told stories. So, you know, to come up with something different and new, it's, it's an mm. enormous challenge. Yeah. So... Is there Eclipse? Uh, then was Conan the Barbarian, I think? Yeah, I worked on Conan for about five years. So, so how, how was that? 
Oh, I love that because I was a big Conan fan growing up. Uh, and you know, I got this is a character so visceral, so yeah, that's the thing about him. I mean, you know, by page three, you know, all everything about him you need to know. There's and, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> it's basically just about coming up with challenges <clears throat> to throw it, him into because he's not going to grow as a character or anything mm. like that. So it's it's about how interesting are the challenges that face him, yeah, suspense situations, and of course, leading to. The ultimate big action ending, but but I loved working on Savage Sword because it was a magazine sized comic in black and white. Mm. The stories were fifty. Yeah, pages. it was beautiful. Yeah, it's fifty pages long. I mean, you got to tell it's, it was like a French comic album. You got to tell a whole yeah. story, you know, right there. So, yeah, you 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 know a little about the French comics, a little yes. bit. <laughs> yes. I have wait. I wish here I in France. Here in France, we we call it. Ban dessiné. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, ha I have I have shelves full of them here. I've always bought them. Really? So yeah. you have some favorite uh, author? Uh, I've been I've been reading a thing called. Um, uh, well, not reading because I don't read French. I got to follow the picture. <laughs> uh, Sauvage. It's a it's a series set during um, when the the uh, Maximilian was in Mexico in the eighteen okay. hundreds. And another series, uh, the Eagles of Rome. Uh, I've been following. So wait, you have comic in French? Yeah. And you just look at the pictures? Well, they're good enough that I can follow the story. <laughs> they're my kind oh, of comics. Okay. They're my kind of comics. I can follow the story by looking at the pictures. Yeah, no, because it happens sometimes that the, this kind of comic, there are huge panels, you know? Yeah. Well, with a really tiny dialogue. Well, they're visually told as well. I mean, yeah. uh, too many American comics, it's talk, 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 and yeah. uh, with kind of dead faces. You don't even get an emotional feel sure. from them. But no, uh, he, French he and here. Belgian comics, you know, you can read them, you can follow it, especially yeah. the Western, because so many American words show up in the Western. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, here is amazing. Here in France, uh, there's a whole culture. But um, there are a lot of superhero comic book fans but there's another side of comics here that they're more kind of i don't know maybe it's not the right word but intellectual or yeah. they they can make a comic of i don't know uh, a family that moved to from the city to the countryside right <laughs> you know like no action you know just a little kind of dialogue or or could be a very mind-blowing science fiction story that you will not you will have to read it four times to understand it right right yeah it, it's a it's a far more diverse audience yeah it's completely it, it's completely diverse but well, here, here they are they they love they love american comics and actually i'm not i live in france but i know uh French. I'm from South America, from oh. Chile. I don't know if you know the country. Which country? Chile. Yeah, of course I know Chile. <laughs> so friends in Argentina. It's right next door. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I actually I didn't know that Fabian Nichesa was uh, their parents are from Argentina. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, Yeah, I um, I worked with a lot of Argentine artists for mm. you know, especially through the '80s and '90s. And I, I visited Buenos Aires. I was a guest of theirs for a while, and uh, I was shocked to learn that so many of my favorite European artists were actually from Argentina. Really? You know, Juan Jimenez, you know, Alfonso Font, guys mm. like that. That you know, I always thought they Alfredo were. Hugo Pratt. No, uh, no. What the name? Hugo Pratt. Yeah, Hugo Pratt. Hugo Pratt, uh, uh, Breccia, you know, guys mm -hmm. like that, you know, uh, Argentina, it's just, you know, I don't know what's in the water down there, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe the water, <laughs> I don't know, but there's a lot of tremendous comic talent down there in, the, in yeah. South America. You, you're a fan of uh, Corto Maltese? Yeah, yeah, I've read a lot of Corto How do you say it in, in, in United States? Yeah, they're published actually by a friend of mine, uh, a friend of mine, Dean Mullaney, publishes okay. them. 
in Spanish, we say corto maltes. Okay. How do you say it in, 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 in the United States? It's corto maltese here. Oh. But, but yeah, good enough? My, my friend uh, Dean Mullaney actually publishes them here. Very nice volumes in English that uh, he translates himself from the yeah. original Italian. So. No, that's really. Uh, no, I, I, I love it too. And uh, no, that's, that's funny. That, so you visit uh, Buenos Aires? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was there for about a month in the 80s because I was working with so many Argentine artists. Uh, I was getting them work. I was suggesting them uh, that they invited me down uh, to meet everybody and basically cement the relationship. And you, have a, you have a funny story to share of your... Uh, to Argentina. <laughs> well, uh, if, if anybody, if you're familiar with the artist Jorge Zafino, uh, we did Winter World together, a number of other comics. Um, if I got to meet him, and uh, I didn't speak Spanish, and he didn't speak English, so we had a translator there. And um, he, uh, the translator at one point had to get up and use the bathroom. <laughs> so it's, it's just Jorge and I just staring <laughs> other <laughs> finally, finally i said joe kubert and he goes see sí, see sí, joe kubert <laughs> and then and then he universal would, language yeah he would say jose garcia sages i was like yeah 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 i know him <laughs> <laughs> we just traded back and forth that's that's a beauty that's a yeah. beauty the same with music you can just uh, it connect people art in general yeah, it exactly. transcend, it transcend language, it transcend boundaries. Is is great. Yeah, so, it, 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 comics and music are a common language. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And how you arrive to the Punisher? Um, I you know I kind of like the uh, the loner character, and uh, I liked. Uh, But you you asked for it, or oh yeah, I bothered, I bothered the editor because uh, I, I <laughs> wanted the Punisher. I don't usually campaign to write a character, but I pestered the, the editor uh, to the point where Mike Barron was the regular writer on it, and uh, yeah, and, and Mike and I are friends, but he got kind of got kind of ticked off at me because I kept trying to write the project. <laughs> but you know, he had two books, so like, just let me write one now and then. And eventually, I became the regular Punisher writer when when he Mike was writing which which book, Mike Barron. He was writing the Punisher and. Carl Potts was writing Punisher Wardrobe at the time. Ah. And uh, but I just kept pestering Don. I kept sending him storylines and plots and ideas. And eventually he hired me and then eventually he used me on everything. I mean, at one point I was writing all three monthlies uh, for a while. Yeah. But I just love the character. No, I love the um, what because what was crazy at the beginning. You know, the Punisher was not a, a famous character that people didn't get. But then the first series start to, this one start to get success. So, right. yeah, War Journal, why not? Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. And then, War Song, go. Right. Right. And then, and then uh, they did back to school specials and summer specials. And there was some armory. Yeah, yeah, Punisher Armory, yeah. That was yeah. like, what the fuck? But I even, ha I have those. <laughs> it was, it was a, it, it was like a, it, it's like the Punisher and G.I. Joe and, and things like that all had their own corner of the Marvel Universe. Yeah. And those were, those were all the editors that I hung out with and, and worked for was in that corner, you know, Conan, G.I. Joe, Punisher, that kind of thing. Yeah. No, but it was crazy that that one moment was like Punisher, Punisher World Journal, Warzone, Armory, Magazine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> graphic novels. Yeah, no, yeah. it was, uh, was crazy. And then Punisher versus Batman. Yes. <laughs> I, I love what you grow there because it's really... What could happen? They do. They did it twice. They did it with uh, with the Azrael too. But 
your your version is way better because I, I I love it. I love especially the dialogue with the Joker. It's like, yeah. Yeah, it, I, I mean, that, that, that was a dream project because they got Archie Goodman. Like, the Joker stopped smiling. He's like, what yeah. the fuck? He was going to real kill me. <laughs> yeah, this guy's going to kill me. But I, yeah, I worked with uh, Archie Goodman was the editor on that. He's my favorite comic book editor. Um, and then, uh, you know, John Romita Jr. artwork. I mean, it just all came together on that. And I, I had the best time writing that. I had the best time writing that because I had been thinking about it for a long time. I mean, yeah. two years prior to that, I had been talking to Marvel about a possible Punisher Batman crossover. And, um, you know, eventually it came about because of uh, Nightfall, the Nightfall event in Batman. So, um, you know, so I got to do it. I mean, um, <laughs> but it was not hard because you were a fan of Batman and the Punisher. So, yeah. what was not kind of difficult to see who was on the top? Or I well, think it was very good balance because you can show that right. the the toughness of of the Punisher, right? But also you show that Batman. He's a superior martial artist and he can kick his ass. So was for me it was perfect. Well, I mean, I you know, going in, I mean, I, I'd written both characters enough that I kind of knew them. I was very conversant with them. So I knew Batman would not care for the Punisher at all. I mean, these guys were never going to be friends. And, <laughs> and then uh, when it came to the final confrontation, Batman was going to win because um The Punisher, as tough as he is and as good with weapons as he is, uh, he's no match uh, hand to no. hand with someone like Batman. No. So I thought, well, I've got to make, I've got to let the Punisher fans be happy and the Batman fans be happy. So I allowed Batman allowed the Punisher to hit him once. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And it's two pages. <laughs> right. like, yeah, you can hit me one time. Yeah. And, Uh, you know, no, so everybody left happy. So I didn't favor one over the other because I didn't want to favor one over the other. I loved both characters. Yeah. No, that's that's amazing. Yeah. And you mentioned Nightfall. Yeah. How did that happen? Was it like because of the dead of? Um, was it the same time of the death of Superman? I think oh, it, it was. It was just after death of Superman had begun. Yeah. And and um, it was a success. And so they turned, Denny O'Neill was the Batman group editor, and basically they told him, you got to come up with something like this. And uh, But they didn't think about, like, the death of Batman? Though, yeah, I'm sure they would have loved if he killed Batman or, you know, killed somebody, you know. <laughs> Denny didn't want to do that. He didn't want to just do the same thing. And of his course. idea was that uh, we put Batman out of commission, it'd be a two-year-long continuity. Yeah. And, you know, You know, we'd have to have a new Batman and uh, create a new villain uh, to go along with it. And he had all of this stuff laid out when they they took us to a retreat. They took us up to Hudson River to some resort. We were there for three days. What? No, yeah. really? Back when they had money and cars. Like resort. Oh, yeah. Was great. I mean, <clears throat> and uh, all expenses paid. And for three days, you know, Denny presented this to us. And, um, Myself and the other two writers and the assistant editors were bouncing ideas off each other. But then he had the whole framework. I mean, you know, everything was there. We just had to figure out how to break it down issue by issue. Do you remember one like a crazy idea that someone would say? Like um no, I can't think of anything in particular. <laughs> I can't like, think of Yeah, anything. let's uh, make Batman the new Superman. I know <laughs> well I Yeah, I'd heard that idea in another retreat uh, where they wanted to. Really? There was a, my last Batman retreat, the Superman editors had come up with the idea that Superman would have amnesia and think he was Batman. So for six months, Superman's running around dressed as Batman. And uh, that idea never went anywhere. <laughs> Are you <laughs> kidding me? Terrible. It's a terrible idea. Of course. So Batman a bunch of guy, he was gonna Yeah, Batman would have been in like 10 books a month. <laughs> <laughs> well, But um, no, I mean it, it 
you know, I don't remember anything, you know, particularly funny happening at <laughs> the nightfall things. I just remember how stunned I was because the first day of the summit, I didn't know why I was there because I didn't have a Batman book. I was writing Robin, but it was miniseries. And mm. I didn't know why I was there. And when we broke for lunch the first day, Denny asked, Denny O'Neill asked me to, to hang back a little bit. And he says, uh, I want to give you detective comics if you're interested. <laughs> So I said, yes, I am very interested. <laughs> well, I, know. Go detective. I don't want. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I said, the chance to work on, um, you know, the longest running comic book in the world. Yes, I, I want to do that. <laughs> so. That's crazy. So Nightfall, okay, the idea of Nightfall, Bane. Yeah. How, how, where? How? Well, <laughs> we knew we wanted a new villain. Uh, we didn't want Batman taken down by one of his already existing villains. So mm -hmm. Denny's idea was we should come out of this the other end with a villain, a lasting villain, a villain who's important to Batman's canon. And the only, the only thing we knew going in was he had to be Batman's intellectual and physical equal, and he had to be addicted to venom which was a, a drug, like a steroid human growth yeah. hormone drug that Denny had created for the Batman universe. And those are the only things we knew. And it's working there. Well, like an analogy to a story, a little? Yeah, maybe, maybe. But, you know, it was, and that was his weakness, was the venom. So because yeah. you know, every villain has to have a weakness. And so that was his weakness. And we, we didn't come up with anything more than that at our first summit because we weren't going to introduce him yet. It was all about setting up Nightfall the, yeah. at the summit. And then we reached a point where we really needed to introduce this guy. Right. And uh, that's when uh, we held like a mini summit. Uh, and he said, well, how do we create this new villain? And I said, um, I was the one that said, you know, it's really tough because this villain's going to have to be popular in order for Nightfall to work. You know, yeah. this character is at the center of this whole event. And he's going to have to be popular. The readers are going to have to respond to him. And I said, how do you do that? How do you, you know, because so many great comic book characters are created by accident, you know, and then you find out the readers like them. And, you know, but we've got to make sure the reader, and that, I said, it's going to be really hard to do. And then he said, if you think it's going to be so damn hard, then you're the one that's going to do it. Because he knew I would sweat it out. So I went home and I started thinking about it. And I thought, well, He should have an origin like Bruce Wayne. He should mm -hmm. have a tragedy in his past when he was a child. And I, I just read an article about how in North Korea, you could be put in prison for things your relatives have done. So in other words, if your dad committed a crime and they couldn't catch him, they would put you in prison. What so, the fuck? Yeah, really? So I thought, wow, what if, what if this character is serving out his father's life sentence And then I thought, wow, what if he's not a kid? What if he's not even born yet? What if his mother is pregnant with him, put in prison, and then when he's born, he's going to serve his life, his father's life sentence? I thought, wow, how messed up a character. What a monster would that create if this guy survived to, to, um, to adulthood? And that's really where it all began. And I, I, I began talking to Graham Nolan, who, who was going to be the artist for the first story, and he suggested – The, a Mexican wrestler look, a, a luchadora look. So we went with that. And then uh, I, I came up with his name. I, I opened up a thesaurus and looked up evil. And I looked at well, all different words for evil. And I came across Bane. I said, Bane, that's a great name. I called the editors and they said, we hate that. We're not calling him Bane. <laughs> so wow. I just started calling him Bane. And about three days later, they started calling him Bane. <laughs> And we never discussed it again. <laughs> But that's how that happened. That's amazing. And what do you think about the adaptation of that character into the movies? Well, I'm glad they made him a household name because, you know, you end up with a lot of these. <laughs> so uh, that's a good thing. Um, you know, but my favorite version of Bane outside the comics is in the cartoons. Mm. I think they did a good But job. I'm sorry, the idea of break the back 
of Batman. I leave it just you didn't kill it. You're just gonna leave it in a wheelchair. Right. Who 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 came up with that uh, idea? That was Denny. Denny came up with he said we have to disable him so that he has to be replaced. And see, one of the problems in in American fandom and Batman fandom is a lot of the fans think that they want Batman to be tougher, Batman to be more like the Punisher. Mm. And they want Batman to be a more of a loner. And Denny rightly was convinced that that's not right, that Batman needs support and Batman mm. has a, a set of rules. He will not kill. And that's yeah. what that's important. And so the whole purpose of the story was to show readers this is why you don't want that kind of Batman. Mm. So we gave them the kind of Batman they thought they wanted, and they hated him. <laughs> yeah, of course. The sales went down. I mean, we had to end the event about six months sooner than we were going to. Because really? Because the sales started falling down so quickly. Because of Azrael. Yeah, they hated him. They hated everything about him, which was what we wanted to have happen, but we didn't think they were going to stop buying the comics. So. Yeah. No, because it's... I think it's really hard to introduce a character that will replace like decades. Oh of yeah. History. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's a great what character. you say, right? Yeah. You, what you say? And then, and then the, the the relationships. I mean, Azrael was never going to have the same relationship with with Alfred, with Robin, with Commissioner Gordon. He was like kind of like the Joker. Yeah. He was like this imaginary. <laughs> imaginary friend that tell them stuff so yeah i mean uh, the, the, that was one of the fun parts of writing asriel uh as batman that as he ran into the uh classic villains the moment where they realized this isn't the same guy that those scenes were always so much fun to write you know when the joker realizes this isn't the batman that no. I, this is a different guy uh and then and then when the criminals began to think well maybe it's always been different guys maybe it's never been the same guy all the time that stuff was a whole lot of fun to write you know to play yeah, with sure the mythos within the mythos like that yeah i think it, the the joker had kind of the same expression when he encountered the punisher while well, like yeah. what the fuck? <laughs> yeah 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 this is <laughs> this guy's gonna kill me <laughs> no, that's great. And birds of prey, how yeah. that happen? Um, well, one of the Batman editors, Jordan Gorfinkel, um, he just had this idea that uh, Black Canary and Oracle teaming up together <clears throat> to have like a female-centric adventure book. He thought that was the greatest idea ever, <clears throat> and I didn't see it. And he kept talking to me about it, and I, I couldn't see it because Black Canary had just had a book canceled. And then and an Oracle, what does she do? She sits in a room on the computer all the time. And I let's grab two unsuccessful characters and put it together. And I, I couldn't see and he said he said there's a natural chemistry. If you know these characters, there's a natural chemistry. And eventually it took months. He talked me into it. And I recently asked him, you know, why didn't you just go to another writer? And he said, Because I knew only you would care enough to make it work. And so I started writing a Birds of Prey special that he got put on the schedule. And in the first six pages, I went, he, he's right. These characters have a natural chemistry. They work together perfectly. And, um, and they, they, they're, they're different enough from each other that it makes it interesting, their relationship. And uh, we just went from there. And it was you know, a very successful book. And eventually went to a monthly book. And, uh, and you, I enjoyed writing it. Why do you think that? It was successful was because um, I well, don't know. It's it, it's hard to it's hard. It to was think. rare to see a female centric. Uh, it was rare to see a female centric book where they kept their clothes on for one thing. That was unusual. <laughs> uh, and they were um, <clears throat> they they were you know they're 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 a tough pair of gals, but they're smart. Uh, Oracle's a lot smarter than Black Canary. <clears throat> that was a lot of the conflict there, but. Um, I just, you know, I just tried to make like basically like everyone was like a James Bond movie, you know. Everyone, uh, you know, I, and created a lot of new villains, and then just coming up with situations to throw them into, <clears throat> and uh, kind of what grew out of it was an unconscious theme of um, of unintended consequences. 
they were always getting into trouble because they relied on Oracle because Oracle is like a, a tech goddess. She's a computer whiz. Yeah. And they would always rely on, on her data when they went into a mission. And her data always turned out to be wrong. And because I, I, I wanted to put out that, you know, we were all relying on computers. This is the 90s. We were all beginning to rely more and more on computers and the age of information. And, and the idea that all human knowledge will be available on the internet. And we all know now that's not true. None of that is true. So much of what we see on the internet is not real. All human knowledge is not available to you on the internet. Yeah. And, and I wanted to show that to rely on that um, in, you know, you know, a situation where you're risking your life would be dangerous because you might be entirely wrong once you got to the place where the mission was. And so many times Black Canary would go and find out she was literally on the wrong side of the fight. <laughs> understand what was going on because all they knew was what Oracle could get off the internet. Sure. So it was like a little you, like a microchip on what? the Punisher. Was yeah, like yeah. Microchip. yeah, microchip. The well, thing about microchip was the Punisher naturally didn't trust a lot of what microchip told him. Or no. There was a lot of humor in that Punisher would take a different inference from what Microchip gave him, you know, yeah. information more differently. And then also the, the greatest tragedy of the Punisher, that, like, that's the recurrent tragedy is, is he's a very abusive to Microchip. He doesn't, he's never grateful. There's not a real friendship there. And every yeah. time Microchip assumes there is, he's proven wrong. Yeah. Yeah, because he like uh, don't trust anybody. No, and and it, it it was crystallized for me when Mike Barron wrote this tremendous Punisher story that really brought the Punisher into focus for me. And it was Punisher was going to all of his different subordinates, you know, the people who worked for him, and he would um, and and we have to remember the Punisher was paying these people; they weren't just sidekicks. He, they this was their job. He was paying the money. From, from yeah. money he took from, you know, the mafia or from drug people. Yeah. And he went to each one for help with some particular problem, and they, they all failed him, and they couldn't do what he needed them to do. And to each one of them, he would say, if you can't do this, what, what good are you? What use are you to me? And I thought, wow, what a son of a bitch. <laughs> what a bastard this guy is. Yeah. I love him. <laughs> I mean, no, but me, for me, uh, the essence of the Punisher is like he's um, he's already dead. He's yeah. just uh, like uh, what I don't know, kind of like a robot, you know. Yeah. He well, he, he, just, embodies, he, he embodies every negative male stereotype. Yeah. Like, he's a slob. He doesn't care what anybody else thinks. You know. Uh, Let's he have a quote. Yeah, yeah. He just runs on rage. You know. He's just you know he's. He's not, he, he's basically, he's the villain in his own book. But that, yeah. that's what I love about him because he's so different from any other comic book yeah. character. What I, what I miss, for example, from the Netflix uh, series, yeah. is his diary. Yeah. Yeah, you need that juxtaposition because I used to write it to get humor into the book. Now, the Punisher was never funny. He never thought he was funny. He didn't say funny things. No. But when you compared what was in his journal to what you could see happening in the story that to me that was always funny yeah he oh, would and, and another yeah. kind of a like a human touch yeah. like yeah today I went to the park and I, I i i i went to central park uh remember when my family was killed and then i eat a glass and then i will Kill so guy from the mafia is like. Right, right. Well, well, he would also keep you informed of what he was doing and why he yeah. was doing it in this particular way. And some of that stuff shocking. I mean, in in Batman Punisher, when he runs out of ammunition when he's pursuing the Joker, uh, he doesn't give up. He just says, "I'm going to have to do the Joker hands on." So yeah. he, I'm going to have to beat him to death with my hands. It's like no <laughs> other character would have he, that. He would never stop. <laughs> What's that? No, he no, he never stopped. He never stopped. Yeah, no, he, that, that's he the beauty of the character. Yeah, he was kind of dead inside. He's kind of already dead. Yeah. 
He he's just waiting to m meet his family. Yeah, I mean, in in Frederick Forsyth's novel, *The Dogs of War*, uh, the lead character is a mercenary, and he dreams that one day uh, he thinks about his own death, and he says, "I want to die with blood in my teeth," and and that's that's the punishment. Yeah, no, for me, it's a really interesting character. Yeah, and I don't know, I always, but I I really kind of I there's a lot of people that love their kind of kicking ass uh, side but well me too but I I love his human side too you know yeah. like for example he can kill I don't know hundreds of people but I don't know if a grandmother want to try to cross the street he was gonna help he you know it's like uh, I yeah. like that he was. Um, I, I would argue with Don Daly, my editor, all the time because I would write stories that I called quality of life crime stories, where he would go after carjackers or people mm -hmm. who rob ATM machines. And Don was like, "No, you know, he should be fighting like supervillains." I'm like, "No," I said, "I'll I'll do those stories where he's fighting some you know somebody super powered." I mm -hmm. said, "But every once in a while, you got to have a story that everybody can relate to." Because he's a, he, just like Superman and Batman and Spider-Man, the Punisher is a wish fulfillment character. It's a dark wish fulfillment where, mm -hmm. well, if I was the Punisher, I wouldn't take this crap from this guy. And uh, and, and to me, I, I wanted to show um, the Punisher fighting the kind of crimes that frustrate us all, the, the injustices mm -hmm. that frustrate us all. So, I mean, you know, if you go off to fight Dr. Doom, it's like, well, I can't relate to that. I'm never going to, Dr. Doom's never going to be a problem for me. <laughs> You know, with somebody breaking into my house in the middle of the night, yeah, yeah the Punisher was there. Yeah, no, that's exactly what happened to me. This is kind of a personal story yeah. that I can share it with you because uh, in Chile, it's not like most of countries in Latin America. There's not a, a lot of violence, but there is some. And sometimes you, you can get, uh, get robbed on the street right when i was young I, that happened to me like i was really shy you know and it happened to me like three times so uh kind of it didn't traumatize me right but i keep it inside so when i discovered the punisher well like, yes <laughs> <laughs> that's that that's the purpose you know that's that's what these characters serve is is that yeah. kind of work fulfillment. It's like yeah. a projection of some I don't know some frustration or something that you you oh, have. Yeah, yeah it's, but in a positive way because you're you're not killing anyone. No, no, no. But it's cathartic. It's, it's yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. Okay. And for you, what is the best representation of the Punisher on the big screen? Um, I so far. I haven't really liked any of them. <laughs> For me, even if what very low budget and everything, I love uh, the Dolph Lundgren version because yeah. he keeps the essence of, you know, the the guy who's dead inside, right? More than more than the others. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it kept the tone of it, but like you said, I, I wish they had the narration. You know the yeah his inner monologue. I, I think that's important. But in the first one, they they, they do it. Yeah, they, they do it. come on God. I I talk with God when yeah. he is meditating in the sewers. They're like that that scene is, is perfect because yeah, I, with Tom Thomas Jane was cool, but it could be any action film. Yeah, also in the Thomas Jane version, and I liked his portrayal, but I didn't like the movie uh, because they, they treat the Punisher like he's a detective because he's trying to mm. you know, get to the bottom of this mystery. And it's like, <laughs> Punisher? The Punisher kills the first guy he meets. You know, yeah. the, you know he's going to kill the drug dealer on the street. He's not interested in the kingpin. And then and then in a great, in a, in a good Punisher story, the kingpin comes after him. I mean, they're, they're ticked because of what he's doing. And yeah. then the criminals come for him. Uh, yeah. The Punisher. The Punisher creates all of his own problems, which is like in the like in the Netflix show. 
That's yeah. more that's more like it. Yeah, and I think John Berthall is a great choice to play him. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I you know, I'm not that crazy about the show. I think they miss something. <laughs> so. Yeah. Can you tell, <laughs> tell us more about it? Because uh, yeah, I I I like it. I like some stuff. I don't like some some other stuff. What yeah. what are the things that you like? Yeah, I really haven't watched enough of it to go into a deep criticism of it. It's just, um, um, you know, I just like to see the story move faster. And, mm. you know, I, I think the problem with binge TV, with streaming TV, mm. is they want to tell one big story. And I, I think uh, with The Punisher, you need you, know, you need some departures. You need some mm. side action. You need some of that instant retribution. Where someone right. ticks him off right away, and then, and they get their comeuppance right then and there, because mm. uh, you know to me that's the Punisher because he's just an instant reaction kind of guy. Mm. For me, what I really like was the second season of Daredevil when they introduced the Punisher, the dialogue, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I always like I got to write a little bit of those characters interacting. I I love Punisher and Daredevil together because they really don't like each other. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, Jing Yi Yang uh, was like absolutely, absolutely. These are two entirely different kinds of people. Yeah, and in they do it in the um, in the I think was the second their season of Daredevil, and but then the show was okay. The first yeah. season of the Punisher was kind of okay, but the second was like. I don't know. I, I didn't get it. With the little girl that he wants to protect, that is like kind of his daughter. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that's the problem with the Punisher is that he's um, he's kind of simple and primal the way Conan is. So it, sometimes it's, yeah. diff it's, it's difficult for some writers. They think too hard about it. And the representation of the microchip on the yeah. Netflix show. You saw it a little? Or? No, I, I haven't seen, I, I never saw a microchip on the show. Really? No. No, it's, I think it's not that bad. At the beginning, I was like, kind of, but I don't know why they changed the stuff, you know? It was good enough. Yeah, it I was mean, good enough. The most they, they killed their son, you're yeah. traumatized, but, well. Yeah, the I don't most know. Successful adaptations to movie and TV are the ones that stay closest to the mm. source material. I mean, I think that's been the secret for Marvel overall is that their their movies tend to stay closer to the source material. Yeah, you you have some good examples of that that you well, I don't know. Well, basically, I mean, in a Marvel movie, um, through most of the, through most of the better ones, um, it feels like the comic book. Yeah. You know, They'll even borrow imagery, direct imagery from the comics. Yeah. So you're like, wow, this is, you know, this is the comic book. You know, it's on yeah. film and it's different, but it's the same. In in a in in a DC movies, I, I rarely get that feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember in Dark Knight Rises, uh, it was one of the rare times I got that feeling in a DC movie. And it was every scene with Batman and Catwoman felt like the comic book. Mm. It, it was perfect. They, 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 it just they nailed that relationship, and they and the visuals and everything. But then all the rest of it, like I don't recognize any of this. You know, what this, do you think about Watchmen? Uh, I couldn't get through Watchmen. I, 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 I was about twenty minutes, and when Richard Nixon shows up, I'm like, okay. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to have fun watching a movie. I don't want to be like, <laughs> especially from you know. No, but Watchmen is really is very politic. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. But I, I just kind of thought, <clears throat> you know, you can deal with politics without dealing with the issues, if you know what I mean. You know, no. um, um, without telling can, you what. Can you play further? Huh? Can what? can you develop further that? Well, well, I mean, I don't mind watching something that deals with political issues as mm. long as I'm not told what to think about them. Ah, uh, that they don't guide you to right to a, you know it's like it's like the movie Doctor Strangelove. I mean, um, you're not told what to think about all this. It's, mm -hmm. it's left to you to make up your own decisions. 
on and, and I think well I, I think that's true of everything Stanley Kubrick directed I, Clockwork Orange leaves you to draw your own conclusions Full Metal Jacket leaves you to draw your own conclusions yeah it's like more open yeah yeah and it's like we've shown you everything we've shown you that war is horrible yeah. and everything else uh but you know you can fall on either side of the political spectrum on on any of those movies mm. uh and and you'd be right because he wasn't telling you what to think i don't want to be propagandized to yeah uh, of course you know so you know. well we already took one hour so i know you you're a bc Busy person, so well, I don't want to leave you with any questions unasked. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have the time, I have many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, let's do a few more. Uh, no, for me, for me is well. I really thank you for accepting my invitation, and I would like you to talk about what are your kind of projects or what are you or working or you want to work in the uh, future well I just, i just did a project called the expendables go to hell uh it's oh the, yes sylvester stallone and the, the, those characters how uh, that happened uh, like crazy but it's really yeah, it's crazy <laughs> it's great i i um I, i wrote an expendables comic back before the first movie came out and But how uh, you get the rights to? Well, I, I I I wrote it. Uh, I wrote it for Dynamite Comics. They got the licensing rights to the Expendables. They asked me to write this prequel story, and all I had was the screenplay. I couldn't see the movie. The movie was still being made, so I worked from the screenplay. And I really liked the characters, and I liked how the the dialogue interchanges between them. And a lot of that doesn't end up in the movie, but a lot of stuff for the screenplay helped me write the comic. So I wrote the comic and then the movie comes out and everything else. And then a few months later, Sylvester Stallone calls me on the phone and he tells me how much he likes the comic and how I got what he, because he wrote the screenplay, how I got the dialogue right and everything else. And would I like to uh, help him with rewrites on Expendables too? So I said, yeah, yeah. And um, I went out to Hollywood and had a meeting and nothing came of it. But he and I hit it off. We, I, you know, I really liked the guy, and apparently he liked me because he kept finding me other work. Uh, I wrote some. Web is, how is like Sylvester Stallone? I can. He's just, a, he's just a, a a nice, really nice guy. I mean, he he had no reason to remember me once they didn't want me on Expendables too. I mean, he could have just forgotten all about me. But he's like a a tough guy, or he's like know, very know, sweet, he, like. Oh, nice to meet you. Yeah, no, he's he, he's basically what you see on the screen, but he's he loves talking about stories, and he oh, loves okay. talking about movies. A storyteller, and he's very he's very hardworking guy. The guy's a complete workaholic, and he kept finding me work. I mean, he he got me writing web content for Lionsgate Pictures. He got me a job doing dialogue for an Expendables game, and then. Oh. <clears throat> At, at one point, we were he was talking to me about a possible Expendables 4, and he said, well, the movie I'd love to make is called Expendables Go to Hell. And I said, well, what's that about? And he said, well, the, the Expendables die, and they go to hell, and they fight Satan. <laughs> and I said, well, they're never going to let you make that movie, but that would be a great comedy. That was his idea? It was his idea. So he said, I said, that would make a great comic book. And then yeah. I put a deal together with Richard Meyer and we crowdfunded it, you know, and I came to, I came to Sly and I said, you know, Hey, we can do this as a comic. And he was all for it. He said, yeah, go ahead, whatever you need. And so we did it and it was very, very successful. And it's the first crowdfunded licensed project. So yeah, we're going to do more of them. Uh, Sly wants us to keep doing them. Yeah. No, so I think that initiative like that, it need to keep happening because I love Marvel, I love DC, but it's like in everything. If you have a monopoly of everything, uh, it's not good. It's yeah, not good. There's no creativity, there's no... Yeah, because you basically have like the same group of people coming up with all the ideas. Yeah. Know? And that's not good. I mean, comics are, 
comics are a vibrant medium. There's a lot of mm -hmm. energy, kinetic energy. You can't harness that. You just got to let freelancers go. Just got to let them create all the crazy mm -hmm. stuff they're going to create and then let it find its own audience. Yeah. No, for me, it's like everything. When you concentrate the power only in one... one yeah, especially, especially when it gets... One, one little group. Yeah, you know, when it gets corporate, when it gets too businesslike. Comics are not... Yeah. Comics are an undisciplined, crazy medium. They should never be corporate. There should yeah. never be a room full of people deciding what will be done. It should be yeah. you and me creating a comic book together. Yeah. I... I <laughs> It was so funny. The the other you you ever meet uh, Todd McFarlane? Who? Todd Todd McFarlane. Oh, briefly, briefly. Because he was talking when he was working for Marvel, <laughs> and was a nightmare for for him because yeah. they said, "Yeah, Todd, we want you to do this." Uh, no, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what? <laughs> we are paying you. <laughs> I'm gonna fall. <laughs> we we're going to do it like this because it have make more sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I would run into and, that. There, there, there's two kinds of editors in comics. There's a kind that wants to tell you what to do, and then there's the kind that trusts you, and they hire you. And if you go wrong, they tell you. But otherwise, they leave you alone. They, they, they trust you to do the work. Yeah, for me, that's the best option because if you work in a, any kind of art, yeah. you, you can. It's, a, it's, not, it's not like... A machine, right? It's proof it. You you can find um well, uh, you can find some documentaries that explain that creativity doesn't work under pressure. Well, also you know? to me, even more importantly, is if you're going to create, you you need to know that the people allowing you to create have faith in you. Yeah, that they For believe example, that you're going to do a great job. And yeah. Otherwise, you're sitting there second guessing yourself. Well, what will they think of this? What will they think of that? I mean, mm. when I write, I don't think about anything else but me. You know, what pleases me? What makes me happy? Yeah. What I want to see in the story, not what you know some room full of people somewhere want to see in the story. Yeah, of course. And so I don't you know. have an who has faith in you, and they know that they, you know, you, you know uh, that they trust you. You can do amazing things. Yeah. I don't know if you are aware about the uh, how they work in Google. In Google, you know the company Google. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they they give their employees some hours of free time, like yeah. go not. You know, you have two hours. To, we you don't have any objectives. You you just work on your projects and then you you show it to us. Right. You know. It's like a very, I, I think it's kind of uh, the evolution of the work environment. Right. Because of course you have to set goals and deadlines and everything, but uh, well, depend on the work you do, but sometimes you need to, to have that space to be creative. Yeah. If not, uh, not, yeah, but you know, I mean, for Google that works because Google produces nothing. <laughs> <laughs> They're a super profitable company, and they don't really do anything other than arrange the content created by other people. <laughs> no, I, for example, all the all the develop, for example, the Google search. Yeah, you just see a, a white screen that you type of stuff, but yeah. everything is. Behind is like crazy. So no, I understand that, yeah. But, but, but you know, um, if, if you had that philosophy, like if you ran a bakery and you said to your one of your employees, well, just go whatever, make whatever cake you want to make. No, no, no. That, that's why I, I, I say that it depends how you work, if your work yeah. is creative. Right. Even in a bakery, for example, yeah. if they, you leave the baker one hour to create a new cake. Yeah. You know, to create a new go nuts, bring me something new, uh, you know, yeah, but, that, but no pressure. That's you know? fine until, you know, they start to run out of donuts and, and this guy's off making. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> it, has to be, it has to be a balance. It, it, it can be, you know, like, yeah, hippie stuff. Uh, no, 
No, but I think creativity needs a space. That yeah. that's my whole point. And yeah. I think yeah. the initiative like like what you are doing, like be independent and uh, doing your own stuff, it helps a lot, you know, to um kind of uh that the power don't stay in in just these two big uh, giants, you know, DC and Marvel. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I mean, they're kind of falling apart at this point. I, 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 mm. I mean, here in the United States, we just don't see it that way anymore. It's it's become so fragmented and yeah. so niche market. I mean, with the money to be made in crowdfunding comics here, uh, it's like you don't need them anymore. We found yeah. we found the audience that they abandoned. You know, yeah. the, the audience that they walked away from are willing to crowdfund comic projects that they like. So, yeah. but but the example what you're talking about about giving people space, the best example I can think of in comics is when DC launched their new 52. They were going to yeah. do 52 titles, and they were going to totally relaunch them. They're all going to be different. The problem is, you know, the same half dozen people decided what all of those 52 titles would yeah. be. Now, right like if, that. if they had given those 52 books to 52 different creative teams and just said, go nuts, you would have had half of them would have been hits, you know, yeah. because those yeah. people would have been unleashed on those characters. Yeah. But because What's like, uh, like Vertigo? Yeah. Well, Vertigo was like that. Vertigo, Vertigo was really free. It's like well, Vertigo was uh, created to find a new audience for comics, and they did. They, yeah. they found a new audience for comics. And let their creators cater to that audience. They listen to their audience. Once they knew what the readers wanted, they created more of that. And that's another thing that that Marvel and DC don't. They are not listening to their readers. And yeah. when their readers say something, Marvel and DC will go, "Well, you're wrong." Well, the readers are never wrong because their money's never wrong. Yeah. You know, the, the the customer's always right. If they want this, if they want Batman to be this way. You make Batman that way. Uh, yeah, of course. And there's space for for everything. I don't know why they sometimes they get so just. I don't know. Well, you have a lot of people working at the big two who aren't comic book people. If you know what I mean, they didn't. Yeah. They don't eat, sleep, and breathe comic books. And mm. you know, and and when they leave DC and Marvel, they'll go on to some other business. Mm. You know, uh, they're not lifers. So that's one of the problems. Sure. They're, they're not interested in the future of comics because they're they're careerists. Mm. I hear that a lot of people in DC Comics that were fired. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah, some of them I was glad to see go. <laughs> <laughs> so you were like, yes. Yes. Some of them I'm like, oh, too bad. I like that guy. But the ones that went, you know, they had it coming. It, it, I, I, so many of them were former Marvel employees, and they, they were former Marvel employees for a reason because they ruined things at Marvel, and then come over to DC to ruin them. But, you know, a few of them that I had been unfortunate enough to work with, mm. and I was not impressed. So, so I don't know what the changes mean or, or what's going to happen there, but uh, somebody understood these people are not doing their job. Yeah. No, it's crazy. Everything that is happening right now with COVID and everything is it's changing everything. It's affecting yeah. everything. Uh, well, it certainly affected the sales of digital comics because they've gone up. So, um, they, do you think that's it's kind of the future? I, yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, who knows what the future is going to be? I never try to guess, and I never thought digital comics. I didn't know one way or the other, but you know. Um, it's a generational thing. I mean, younger mm -hmm. readers, I mean, you look at something like Webtoons and you read them on your phone, they have 41 million subscribers worldwide. So yeah, I guess that's the future. Yeah. If there's not For 41 me, I'm, people reading other kinds of comics. Yeah. For me, it would be great if someone invent, uh, you know, like a tablet. This yeah. Size. They, that, I've been saying that for years. If they made a tablet the size of a comic, I buy it immediately. It's perfect. I buy it immediately. They have the technology now. Yeah. You know? And you you will gonna just do it. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, I don't know why it hasn't happened, except comic sales just don't mark. They don't warrant it. But just make me a tablet that size. <laughs> and you yeah. make tablets that size, why not one a little, little bigger? Yeah. A little bit bigger. Yeah, no, it's crazy. But but what do you think about digital comic? Do you, you already read it? Or? What's that? The digital comics. You already uh, try to I, read I, it? I rarely read them. I mean, I have a bunch downloaded onto my Kindle Fire, but I, I rarely look at them. Um, yeah. You know, it's, a, it's a generational thing. I'm, I'm used, I want yeah. to hold it in hands. No, for me, for me too, it's so, so different. And yeah. it's kind of a primal stuff, like the smell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the smell of that old comic is like, hmm. <laughs> I'm home. <laughs> no, I, I really thank you for your time, Mr. Dixon. This was now oh, Chuck. Please call me Chuck. Chuck. So formal. <laughs> no, it was great. And, well, um, I don't know if you um, you want to invite uh, people to I don't know check your your website. I think was like yeah I'm I'm at Chuck uh, Chuck Dixon dot net. Yes. A lot of stuff there to look at, and uh, you know just uh, go on Amazon put my name in. <laughs> There's many many pages of my work. Yeah, um, for sure. But um. What are you doing right now? You are, I don't know, like, uh, for example, if uh, someone is interested to, I don't know, hire you to write something, how, uh, how they can contact you? Well, I, I'm, I'm on Facebook uh, in a couple of places and, um, <clears throat> you know, It's not really that hard to find me, get, get a hold of me. I'm all over the place. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there you are. There I am. There's my website. ChuckDixon.net. So I really thank you for your time, for all the amazing memories that you have. And. Well, What? This was fun. I liked it. <laughs> yeah, no, for me too. For me too. The dream come true. <laughs> so right. take care and well, take care during this crazy time. I wish yep. you the best and I hope we see us again sometime. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have me back anytime. Okay. All right. Bye. <laughs>